Hi, folks. Welcome to Tortoise Group. I'm Kathy Yeager, your chair, and we're delighted to have you today. We've got a fabulous setup of information. So, welcome. Is there anybody who's new today who hasn't been to Tortoise Group today yet? Anytime? Ooh, great. Wonderful. If you have questions, don't leave without getting them answered. We have lots of folks here who can help you. And uh, we'll have a question and answer section, session, so just ask away. Let me look at the agenda. Oops. Okay. We're going to have some announcements and then some questions. And uh, late summer care, I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, then we'll have a refreshment break. And then we have a whole horde of folks from the US Geological Survey back here. who are going to talk to us about all kinds of fascinating things. So you really did a great thing by coming today. Not missing this. Let me tell you a little bit about what's going on with tortoise group. Scott back here hiding out back there but Scott videotaped our last meeting and it's online and people have been asking and asking for this and uh, I got the most wonderful emails as if I had done it you know thanking thanking us for finally getting this online we have at least half our membership is out of state or out of the city so finally they have a chance to see all this information thank you Scott it's a big job. He has to edit the thing, and then we have uh, Don putting it up on the website, so a lot of folks involved in that. I wanted to give you a little update on the adoption fairs that we held. If you remember, we had a big one in Boulder City. Lee, where did you go? There you are. Lee was is very involved in working with this, and our mailing person, Mark Martin, is very involved with that too. And we've had just the wimpiest response. A couple of adoption applications, a couple of phone calls, but it hasn't resulted in a whole lot of adoptions. So still, we're not able to get all these tortoises out there. Now, Henry just told me he's got several males he'd like to find homes for. Well, if you know of any people who are interested, if you can talk to your friends and say, gosh, you better get one of these fabulous pets, it would be a good outlet. And if so, let me know, please. I also want to let you know about the vision committee. This is what we're calling the committee that's going to. We hired a consultant. She was here last time, Lisa Mayo de Riso. Eight of us got together with her. Bates is here. She's on the vision committee. And um, we were working starting from our mission and our vision, and we're going to do a whole long term strategy for this group up through hiring an executive director, finding an office space, which is going in a whole different direction than we are right now. Sort of like a big committee. So hang on you what's happening as it goes along. Um, I also want to mention, of course, the tortoise overbreeding situation. I keep harping on it because this is our biggest problem. All these pet tortoises and no place for them to go. And right now, of course, we have little ones popping out all over the place. And the outlook for those tortoises is pretty grim. A lot of them will get handed out like Oreos and they'll get put in a box or a swimming pool or an aquarium and pretty soon they'll die very grim. So we want to halt the overbreeding situation if we can by separating the sexes. I also want to remind you to register your tortoise online if you have not. Our next meeting is September 28th. We're going to have an auction of tortoise items. 
you know, tortoise stuff mostly, and other things that have been donated to tortoise food. And I looked over this stuff, and here's the kind of thing we have. Earrings, tortoise earrings, tortoise pins, like a beautiful carved wooden tortoise, an old map, some random t-shirts, non-tortoisey. The really nifty thing is an antique liquor bottle, I think it's bourbon, in the shape of a tortoise. That full antique, so it's really aged in the bottle. Um, an antique Pitney Bowes scale, if you can imagine, and, and other things. So we'll be having a little auction next time. If you have anything that you want to donate to the auction, especially if it's tortoisey, do bring it. And last time we had one last year, we had such a good time. It was really a kick. Um, for the quick tick tip, I imagine I'll be talking about rumation next time. And our speaker will be Jim Moore of the Nature Conservancy. He's going to talk about how green is your generation. Now, here's a pitch for volunteers. You know, we have so many people working in tourist group to do things, and here are a couple of things we need. We're going to be doing a redesign of our website, but right now, we just need a little help with the homepage. If there's somebody here who's a web designer and would uh, work with Don Nisley on that, um, please let me know. Again, we still are looking for a treasurer. Trilla wants to resign after all that she has resigned, but here she is. It didn't work. <laughs> and uh, we really need someone to take over that job. Someone who has experience, who knows QuickBooks, who's a real bookkeeper, bookkeeper. And, and we have Susan here who does the Mega Diet Fulfillment online. And we also need somebody to learn how to do that to back her up. So anybody who could do those, let me know, please. Okay. Is anybody having trouble with not your tortoise not eating mega diet? I've had some people tell me that they've had trouble, and I'd like to hear some success stories Somebody who had trouble with their tortoise eating mega diet and then got it to eat the mega diet. Yeah, Bobby, what did you do? How long did it take her? How long did it take her to switch over? People are saying, my tortoise is never going to eat that stuff, and my dad can't understand it because I tell him about it, and then he has another six mouthfuls, and he thinks it's fabulous. What have you guys tried and hasn't worked for you? Because somehow we need to get over this. Okay, so Sue suggests for the mega diet is to stuff it inside a willow blossom. Another suggestion is to hollow out a cherry tomato and put it in there, not tomato leaves, those are poisonous, but the ch cherry tomato. Another thing would be to wrap it up in a grape leaf or a, a dandelion leaf or something. And of course, hand feed them then, you know. Then it's a lot yummier than if it's just sitting there. We seem to have two camps, though really just love it to death and the really won't eat it. And we're looking for solutions for these holdouts. Okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what's going on now with tortoises with behavior. Their changes, some planning and pruning. We had questions about normal pee and poop last time, and that's always a hot topic. And, uh, and we have a video made by our USGS folks, and it's about, it shows a tortoise hatching. So what's going on right now? All of a sudden, 
it's getting cooler and the tortoises are going to be out more. The males have a little more testosterone on going on and they're pacing back and forth and they're going to be very active. It's going to be a lot like spring where they're eating a lot and, um, and they're out and it's cool because I mean, it's fun because you get to see them and you get to be with them instead of summer where you just have maybe an hour or two with them. It's possible that your tortoise could start going into brumation in mid-September or even disappear. Some start that early. It's really unusual, but could happen. It's usually sometime in October when tortoises go into brumation, but any time from early, from mid-September to early November. So just a little quick preview of that. What happens is they decrease their activity, they decrease their eating, and you start seeing them less and less. So from seeing them every day, you might see them only three days a week and then one time a week and then that's it. Make a note of when your tortoise goes into brumation and it'll be about the same time next year. They're pretty predictable. Their diet's going to change a little bit. They have a preference for plants seasonally, so the things that they were really excited about in spring may not excite them so much in fall and they may like some other things. And they're especially like dried grasses and leaves, which makes sense because that's what they'd be eating if they were wild tortoises. Everything's pretty dry out there. And uh, again, there's going to be an increase in appetite, an increase in growth, and they're going to put on some little growth lines now when they eat. There's Ted chomping away like he always does. This is, the, this is the time pretty soon to be putting in new plants. Now, I've called Star, and I went over there, and there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing there. They have maybe a Mexican evening primrose, and that's it. But pretty soon, they'll be getting all their fall plants, so you'll want to put some things in that'll get a good start. All the primroses are good. Mexican evening primrose, yellow trailing primrose, Tufted evening primrose. They do have gazanias, that's about it. You'll want to put in some globe mallow, some yellow bells. If you don't have a, a grape, that makes the most wonderful thing. I keep pushing grapes, and I'll show you one in a sec. And if you think you can grow one of these, <laughs> there are some for you to pick up here, along with some other seeds. Uh, from our Cactus Joe's mix, help yourself. Also, if you picked up hollyhock seeds earlier in the year, this would be the time to be planting them. And also, don't forget about the cantaloupe seeds. Is anybody, how many of you are doing cantaloupe seeds? Oh, not enough. Are you eating cantaloupes? If you eat cantaloupe, scoop out the seeds, put them in something, and it's so easy to go out to some place where there's water out there and scoop a little dirt off and plop them down with all the stuff that came with it, cover it up a little bit, keep it damp, and you'll get some little sprouts. You get about this big. And then and there are a couple of leaves on top, and then there are no leaves. And not a hint of a plant. You say, where did they go? And your tortoise is going, hmm. It's a good snack. They love those, and they're full of all kinds of nutrition. Did you hear that? That Norm Schilling's going to be at Plant World on the 21st of September answering questions about planting. Here's Spurge. You can tell what it looks like if you're not familiar with it. It's that little teeny plant that grows everywhere. There's overspray. If you pull it, it's got milky substance in the inside, which is normally not good, but tortoises just eat it everywhere. So you don't have to weed anymore. Now when you're pruning, because there's going to be this big growth now, and uh, so check it. Here's, here's this wonderful grape leaf house, you see. 
I pruned it out down here because it all grew all of a sudden. About a foot of growth. So this is where Tad likes to walk. So I pruned it all out so he has a nice tunnel down here where he can walk. This is my sick looking poor old man. I don't know what's going on. Oh. Now here's the pee and poop slide. For those of you who are not familiar with pee and poop, this is the, this is the one we have in our booklet that shows pee is normally the, some fluid stuff and some urate salts. And it's often gritty like this. This is a little bit pinky, which means it's probably been in the bladder a while and maybe there wasn't a lot of fluid going on. When there's a lot of water going in, like at your house, hopefully, the tortoise voids its bladder a lot, and this is good. This is good stuff. This is what my tortoise did, which is kind of weird, but, you know, he had bladder surgery. When he had his bladder stones removed, and it's been unusual ever since. Sometimes it comes out, so it's sort of like egg white. You know, it's kind of ooky. And, uh, so when you, but these are all normal and they all vary and you want to make sure that pee's coming out because it's a good thing. And um, when you see this, you don't want your tortoise walking in it all the time. So hose it down somehow or pick it up or something. And, oh, darn it. Well, maybe you can see this anyway. This was the um, question that we had last month. And somebody says, what does a normal poop look like? And you still can't see. But what, what I wanted to show was I snapped this one open. And it's very fibrous. Uh, and for the very first time in my tortoise's life, he's 30. He's pooping normally. I don't know why he wasn't able to, but he's really able to with this new stuff. They See, there's a little bit of white on here kind of urine stuff, that's normal. They shouldn't be juicy and black. They are, something funny's going on. They're kind of hard, slide out easily, dry out quickly. Easy to pick up. Your dogs like to eat them. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Well, yes, and if, so if he's eating this new mega diet stuff, it's nice and fibrous. Um, it didn't look like this on the old mega, uh, original mega diet. I don't want to call it old. It had a more solid consistency, I would say, than really fibrous. Now, you know what tortoises eat in the wild? Grasses, leaves, little flowers when there are some. So it should be very fibrous. Now, I want to just mention monsoon time once again, because that's what we're going to have this weekend. Um, here's Ted drinking from a little, little tiny bit of water on the patio when he's got a great big pond right next to him. But of course, and everybody says, why are they doing it? Well, this is one of their primary strategies for survival, to come out and drink when there's water. And they're going to do it. It's a huge instinct. And what I've discovered, this is my girl, is there was Tad out in the rain, way up, he had his rear way up so he could stick his snout down, or his beak, I guess, and drink from the little teeny pools in here. He's found that there's water up there. He races right up there when it rains because he has learned that's where there's water and that's what tortoises do. So I cover my burrow. I just covered it before I left. And sure enough, it started raining before I got out of the driveway. And so as soon as it stops raining, I'm going to pull it off because I don't want to create the greenhouse effect, which is nice and steamy in there. So if you want to give your burrow a break, you can cover it if it's going to be real rainy. Yes. Now. The, hatch, the hatchlings are coming out. Please remember that they have to live outside. Tell all your friends who are trying to give you some, no, I won't take one. If you do have hatchlings, 
please, or, or any other tortoise that you need to give away, please find somebody who can take it and ask them to contact us to help them with a habitat. Whether it's a big tortoise or a little one, back to hatching. It occurs anytime from now through October, people find them. And I want to show this little video now that shows a little tortoise hatching. And this was made by our USGS folks. When, when, um, so the tortoise, the eggs incubate anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Those on the top of the burrow, well, those incubated at higher temperatures will be fem females and those at lower temperatures, males. Um, it was 86 degrees, though, uh, something like that. And um, as, the incubate, as the hatching time occurs, the shell becomes thinner. It's pretty tough at first. There's some right over there for you to look at, but it, it thins as it gets close to hatching. And the little guy has a little egg tooth on his nose that he pokes so that he can get a little hole in that egg and start coming out.
All right, folks, we're going to get going so that we have plenty of time for our speakers. For um, anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Mandy Nicholson, and um, I've been on the board for about a year now. And in addition, I've been some of the, doing some of the work arranging these meetings and um, lining up the speakers this year. And this year, this month, we have the pleasure of not one speaker, but um, we have multiple presentations. So you're getting a lot for your money in this, this month's meeting. Um, everyone here is a biologist. Um, they are from the Western Ecological Research Center of the U.S. Geological Survey out in Henderson. And um, the um, lead research eco eco ecologist is uh, Todd Eskew, and I'm going to ask him to come up. He's going to say a word about the team, and in in consideration of the timing and the fact that we want to really get to their good presentations, we're going to let you guys read. Um, the background of everyone who's presenting today is on our website, on the events tab, where all the information about today's meeting is located. So there's um, good background about their different projects and, and their education. We're going to let you guys check that out there. And um, so Todd, if you don't mind, come on up, say a minute about the team, and then we'll get going with the presentations. Uh, my name is Todd, and uh, I've been studying tortoises, wild tortoises, for um, since 1980. So you can do the math on that. Um, I, I've seen this group evolve over time because I've given a few speeches here, and uh, and I've actually known some of you for decades. It turns out, um, and so I'm really glad that this group is here and the function that they serve. Because uh, what better advocates for also for the work that we're interested in, which is the conservation of wild populations of tortoises out in the desert. So I really appreciate that the work that you do here, and uh, so I just signed up to be a member because I need some of this information because I crossed the line and now I have a pet tortoise a few years ago, and uh, and he's very spoiled as well. My wife the other day uh, said that Gary was out and he didn't have anything to eat, and so she took this calistromia that I had been nurturing for all summer and by the roots put it in with, and I looked in and it was in there with Gary, and I thought, oh my gosh, you didn't do that, did you? But it was Gary, so nobody got in trouble. Um, so we have a research team that I, I'm very proud of. Um, we've assembled this team over, over years and people come and go. I'm only allowed to have one permanent employee that works with me, uh, in the agency that I work for the U S geological survey at a time. So I have folks that come in and sort of do a, a journeyman's type, uh, uh, experience in research. And many of them come as interns first. They do a 12 week, uh, program. Um, and, um, we have an apartment arranged uh, and they come and volunteer for 12 weeks and work really really hard and about one in ten of them has what it's what we need to see in a person to be able to continue working with us in a successful way and also they like that kind of work enough that they would be willing to stick around so of those this is the cream of the crop the people that come in uh, that are selected from uh, a lot of other people you know, that have been um, willing to come and do this kind of work and uh, rather than have me talk for uh, a little while about you know, all the different things that we work on, um, I thought it would be really fun to have some of these folks who have been very dedicated in their work. And, uh, and in the summer, they're out night and day working on getting the information. And, and our work is to answer questions for the people that are in the agencies, like the Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM, the National Park Service. When they have issues related to natural resources, like the desert tortoise, and they ask us to help them answer those um, the questions that they have about the management of these species and how to uh, properly conserve wild tortoise populations. And so uh, we have projects that span the gamut of, of research topics in the desert right now. Uh, and these guys are going to give you a, a sort of a, a sample of that. And the first speaker is Marguerite Walden, who uh, was one of the people that started as an intern and, uh, and then decided she wanted to stick around. Then she went and became uh, a librarian for a while. And then I got an email that said, would you give me a recommendation if I wanted to be a biologist again? And we said, wow, Marguerite wants to come back. Let's, why don't you come and work for us? So here she is again. And uh, so here we go. Let's see what she's got to say. Thanks, Todd. Um, I just want to say this is my first time here at Tortoise Group. And I am very excited that you are willing to listen to me. I always love a captive audience with closed doors. <laughs> so. Um, 
I'll start off our talk. I'm going to talk about some research that we've been doing over the past seven years in the Mojave Desert. Um, I'm presenting this talk on research that is currently in preparation as a manuscript by my colleagues at the USGS. So let's see if my technology skills are going to keep up here. Yes, success. All right, so um, before I start, I wanted to thank all the people who made this project possible. Um, Alicia Stiles from Nevada BLM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Dow. I'm going to move through here, I apologize, but um, we also had a lot of USGS, a lot of USGS staff and SCA volunteers um, who made this possible uh, by all their many hours in the field over the many years. Um, and then the funding was from the BLM, uh, Coyote Springs Investment Properties, and some USGS sources as well. So a lot of people came together to make this possible. So on to the details. Um, as you all are no doubt very familiar with, um, the Mojave Desert population of the desert tortoise was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1990. Um, as part of that listing, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service designated critical habitat. So this is habitat that's considered necessary for their physical and biological needs to aid the recovery of the species across its range. Um, and Desert tortoise survival is threatened by many different things, habitat loss, um, some caused by humans, predators, other things not listed here like disease. I'm going to be talking today specifically about wildfire. And wildfire is a risk in the Mojave Desert because of invasive annual, um, invasive annual grasses that come in. So what happens is these grasses are very quick to reestablish after a fire. Um, and they increase the fuel load, which encourages another fire to come through and burn even more intensely. So it's a, let me try this, haha, -ha! another success. So this is a self-reinforcing cycle um, that is causing increasing concern for managing the Mojave Desert for desert tortoises. Let me show you what that means, a little larger picture here. So this is an area of the desert that burned in 2005. This is a picture taken in July, which is about a month after the fire went through. In May of the next year, you can see the invasive grasses that came through. So they're filling up the spaces between shrubs, making it really, really friendly to any fire that would like to come through again. So this is what we're concerned about. And our study took place, um, there was a complex of fires that burned in 2005 um, that burned some about 36,000 acres, a little bit more of designated tortoise critical habitat in southern Nevada. And so that critical habitat is in yellow. Um, not all of it is shown here. We focused our study area in this spot, um, which is called Coyote Springs, also known as Hidden Valley. Um, and so we're looking at the fire that burned in that critical habitat, which is in yellow. And this area is north of Las Vegas. If you take the 15 north and take the 93, it's just past that elbow. Um, so what question were we asking? Why were we doing this study? Why do we care about desert tortoises and fire other than that they live in the Mojave and fires sometimes happen and are happening with increasing frequency? Well, um, we wanted to figure out what are the indirect effects of fire on tortoises because we don't really know that. We know that there are direct effects like mortality, smoke inhalation, um, but we don't know what the indirect effects are. So if the vegetation changes, um, if there aren't any perennial plants anymore because they've all been burned down to the ground, what does that mean for the tortoise? Are tortoises even using the habitat after a burn? Can they use the habitat? Is there any food for them? Um, and this is critical, critical habitat for the tortoise. So does it make sense to manage this habitat after a burn if the tortoises aren't using it anymore? So we were looking at, in order to measure that, we wanted to look at what's actually happening with the habitat and then what's happening with the tortoises on that habitat. So we looked at 25 tortoises between 2006 and 2012, so about seven years. Um, so we looked at annual plant biomass, which is basically how much of the plant grows during the spring, during its main season. So we established 18 paired plots um, in that burn that you saw on the map um, and clipped all the plants, dried them out, and weighed them. And we saw some interesting results. So the first thing I'll point out on the left are the native annual grasses. So this scale, this goes from 0 to 20 grams per meter square. On the right are the non-natives. And that goes from zero to 50 grams per meter squared. So right away, you can see that there was a much greater volume, a much greater biomass of non-natives that came in um, after the burn and on the burned habitat. So the black bars here are the burned areas. Uh, the second thing that you can note 
is in 2006, so this was the year after the 2005 fires, there was a really high volume of non-native grasses that came in, non-native annuals that came in compared to the native annuals. So already you could see that some interesting things are happening on this burned landscape. We also did uh, linear transects on those 18 paired plots to look at perennial vegetation cover. So as you know, um, tortoises will use shrubs like creosote or Joshua tree for shelter and thermal regulation. Um, so we wanted to look at what was happening with those as well. And you can see that the unburned cover remained relatively constant over the years, but there was an increase in the burned areas. And this was mostly due to your herbaceous shrubs coming back and reestablishing after the fire after a few years. Um, so these would be like your desert blow mallow or your desert marigold. So we have some idea of what's happening with the habitat now. Let's look at what the tortoises themselves are doing. Um, so we wanted to figure out where the tortoises were moving. Were they in the burned areas at all? So we did a bunch of surveys and some more surveys and we did some more surveys. <laughs> and what we found was that tortoises um, really liked the edges of the burn, but we didn't find any tortoises in the center of the burn. Um, these tortoises, so these are, each color represents one tortoise and the color, the spots are the locations of those tortoises. So we had tortoises that were moving back and forth between the burned and the unburned vegetation. Individual tortoises liked both habitats. We had a few that stayed outside in the unburned, but most of them moved back and forth. So that was interesting. Um, out of the over 12,000 observations we had on these animals, almost a little over 48% were in the burned. So we can say with this definitively, tortoises are using burned habitat, um, which is very exciting. We did this um, by radio tracking. We put a radio transmitter on these animals and then tracked them regularly. So this is Miguel demonstrating how to radio track an animal. Um, and then we also put GPS loggers on the tortoises. So this would give us an even better idea of the tortoises' movements above ground. So we collected a lot of observations over seven years. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide because this is a this is a really interesting pattern that emerged that we didn't we didn't think to expect when we started this study. Um, so what happened is in the spring and the fall, tortoises were moving more into the burned habitats. The burned is the dotted line, and so on the the y-axis is the distance that they're moving into the habitat. So you can see it increases in May and then again in September and October, um, and then in July and August when really hot in the desert, they were actually moving out of the burned area and a little bit more into the unburned areas. So we have a really interesting, pretty clear pattern that's established about tortoise movement and behavior. Um, we looked at some other things, <laughs> which I will, I don't have the time to talk to you about now. Um, but let me, let me review what we were faced with when we began the study, the state of knowledge. So we knew that tortoises faced some immediate harm from fire. This is an animal that we found in 2006 that had obviously been damaged by the burn. It was alive. It was a living tortoise. Um, but about 70% of its carapace had been burned. You can see the bone exposed. Um, it also had scaled, um, scaled, <laughs> used scales on its forelegs. Um, so we followed it for three years. We put a radio tra transmitter on it and a GPS unit. And we saw it um, start to develop that um, laminar surface on top of the bone. And then in 2009, the radio fell off, so we lost the animal. So I like to think of it as roaming around and <laughs> improving in health out there. But um, so that's a pretty obvious direct harm of fire. So what are the indirect harms? We know that perennial plants are important for cover. We knew that annual plants are important for the tortoise's diet and as a source of water. So we don't know. We haven't been able to demonstrate in the long term what the indirect effects are. So we tried to answer those questions. <laughs> So these are the main takeaways, um, at least at this point. Um, the first is that we were able to document there were substantial substantial changes in vegetation. Um, and then we, when I try to put the pieces together for you here, let's see if I can manage this, um, we found an interesting correlation between what was happening with the vegetation and what was happening with the tortoises. So remember I showed you, showed you that chart of the tortoises moving further into the burned areas during the spring and fall. Well, remember, with the annual biomass, we have a lot of those um, invasive, uh, non-native grasses coming in in the spring, more, more than in the unburned areas. So it's possible that tortoises are moving into the burned habitat to feed because there's more food available. But it's this invasive annual grass, which one of my colleagues will talk about a little bit later. Um, so you can see that 
tortoises are using the burn habitat. Um, they're making movements into and out of the burn habitat. And there are some interesting um, behavioral differences as well that we're seeing with the tortoises because there isn't that perennial cover uh, for thermal regulation. So I hope that gives you at least some idea of the exciting work that we've been doing over at Coyote Springs, north of Las Vegas. Um, and with that, you'll get to hear from my colleagues, Felicia, Chen, and Dan, who are going to talk about fire in the Sonoran Desert and its implications for the Sonoran Desert tourists. Thank you. I'm going to take the host once again. I'm going to start out by talking and giving you some background information about the desert tortoise in Arizona and about wildfires in the Sonoran Desert. And then Dan will give you a brief overview of this exciting new study that Todd just referenced. Um, it's something we initiated this spring at the request of um, Arizona BLM's Endangered Species Coordinator, and it's supposed to investigate the short and long-term effects of wildfires on Sonoran Desert tortoise habitat. So here's a picture of a Sonoran Desert tortoise. Uh, there you go, pointer. Um, it is, this genetic studies show that the two desert tortoise species diverged between five and six million years ago. And there are currently a bunch of behavioral, morphological, physiological differences between the two species. Um, for example, the two tortoise species have different shells, sizes, and shapes. Uh, they have different activity periods. Um, I heard you guys mentioning earlier that Mojave tortoises estivate often during the summer, but the Sonoran tortoise is often more active in the summer than in the spring. Um, and there are a bunch of other differences we can talk about them later if you're interested. Um, the Sonoran population of the tortoise is not listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, in 2010, however, the Fish and Wildlife Service did determine that the Sonoran tortoise the listing is warranted, but it's precluded due to higher priorities. And so they've currently placed it on the candidate list for protection. And uh, this the status is up for review soon. OK, so where exactly is the Sonoran tortoise found? Uh, it is found exclusively south and east of the Colorado River. Um, so this is the distribution of the Sonoran Desert tortoise. Uh, about 50% of its range is found in Arizona, and the other 50% extends down into Mexico. Uh, this is a map that shows land ownership in Arizona, and these diagonal lines here are tortoise habitat. And as you can see, actually it's a little hard to see, but this lighter tan color right here and the blue um, it's either land that's managed by federal or state agencies. And so you can see 80%, almost 80% of tortoise habitat in Arizona is uh, on land managed by governmental agencies. And so they have a best interest in making sure the habitat is protected. Uh, so what does tortoise habitat look like in Arizona? Um, here's a picture of pretty typical habitat. Uh, tortoises mostly occur in uh, desert scrub with, that's dominated by saguaros and palo verdes. Um, in the Sonoran Desert, they prefer rocky hillsides that have moderate to steep slopes. Um, and occasionally, they are found in the flat sandy valleys as well, uh, which is where most Mojave tortoises are found. Um, so tortoise habitat in the Sonoran Desert, as well as the Mojave, face a number of threats, uh, including fire. Um, fire in the Sonoran, as in the Mojave, has increased 
significantly in frequency over the last four decades. Um, and this is due to a number of reasons, including the invasive grass fire cycle that Marguerite mentioned earlier. Um, and as the human population in Arizona increases, both in rural and urban areas, the uh, number of human caused fires has also increased exponentially in the last few decades. Um, and here is a map showing fire occurrence in Arizona in tortoise habitat between 1980 and 2005. So each of these red dots represents a different fire. So as you can see, there are a lot of fires occurring. Um, so fire has a negative effect in the Sonoran Desert. Um, desert plants are not well adapted to fire since fire was a really rare occurrence for thousands of years. Um, desert plants have not evolved the characteristics that would allow them to uh, reestablish after a fire. So here are some photos that we took of, this is a burn saguaro. Uh, this is a Palo Verde with some burn scars. And here's a young saguaro that also has some burn scars. Um, so these plants are still standing. Sometimes uh, plants that do survive will die a few years after a fire. And sometimes they'll just keep living for decades with these scars. Um, because habitat is so important for tortoises to find shelter, uh, well, Marguerite already discussed a lot of these, but there are direct impacts to tortoises from fire, including mortality. Um, and what we were focusing on was the effect that fire has by degrading tortoise habitat. Hi. So as Felicia noted, the Sonoran Desert population of the desert tortoise is currently up for review by the Fish and Wildlife Service for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And along with this, there is a specific need for information about the effects of fire, of fire on their habitat. So we designed a study to evaluate the effects of fire on desert tortoise habitat at different times and in different habitat types that are favored by the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. And with this information, we will then be able to evaluate impacts to characteristics of that habitat that are important for the tortoises. So some of the things that we looked at at our study sites, um, most of our measurements were based on perennial plants, which provide most of the structure in the habitats. So we looked at cover. That's basically the aerial projection of a plant above the ground. Uh, height, that one's pretty obvious. Density is basically the number of plants in a given area and species composition. We identified all the plants on our sites. Um, and we also looked at the abundance of these invasive annuals you've been hearing about, like red brome and Mediterranean grass. Now we took all of these measurements at both burned sites and adjacent unburned areas so we could get a good comparison there. This picture on the right here is one of our study sites in a burned area of Arizona upland Sonoran Desert vegetation. This is the preferred habitat type for the Sonoran Desert tortoise. So we conducted these measurements at a series of 14 fires spanning a large portion of central Arizona. Now, ideally, if you wanted to study the effects of fire through time, you would monitor an area before the fire and then follow that same area through time after the fire. But if you want to know what it looks like 20 years later, that would take 20 years, right? So what we can do is what's called a chrono sequence, a chrono sequence where we substitute space for time. So of our 14 fires, some occurred a very long time ago, so as far ago as 1980, and some are more recent in 2005. And all of the fires, as you can see from the hatching, are in preferred tortoise habitat. And they're on a combination of BLM and US Forest Service land. Now, with this chrono sequence, we can kind of put together um, the different recovery times for different areas. And when we put together those different stages of recovery, we can get at the overall picture of what the recovery time is over 30 years. Now, we're actually still collecting some data for this study, but based on what we have now, we can make some preliminary observations on fire in Sonoran Desert tortoise habitat. So 
This graph here on the bottom, this is the amount of time after the fire occurred, years after fire. And on the side here, this is the amount of cover in burned areas relative to unburned areas. So at five years, the burned area had 40, a little over 40% of the cover that is found in an unburned area. And this, this graph is actually a combination of some of our data and the published source. But the takeaway is that in the Sonoran Desert, some communities can reestablish cover after a period of only 15 years. Now, since tortoise behavior has um, been studied in fires in the, been studied after fires in the Mojave Desert, the logical question to ask is how does this recovery period compare to what you see in the Mojave Desert? So if you look here, the first thing to note is that the time period on this graph is twice as long. So in the Mojave Desert, after 40 years after fire, there's about 60% of the cover in the burned area compared to the unburned area. Well, in the Sonoran Desert, the same amount of cover could be um, reachieved after half the time. So for vegetation cover, at least, it appears that the recovery time may be twice as fast in the Sonoran Desert as in the Mojave Desert. But what about community structure, which is also important to tortoises? So this is, it looks like, sorry, it looks like one of our figures got switched, but this is height. Um, of course, one was supposed to be covered, but, so height, the recovery period. <laughs> is um, a little longer than for cover. Um, if I had the right image for cover in here, this would be 100% at 15 years. Sorry about that. But for height, after 25 years, it's still at about 80% of the cover of unburned areas. So this is a um, area that burned about 13 years ago in Sonoran Desert upland vegetation, which is preferred for tortoises. As you can see, there are a few remaining saguaros here, um, but most of the vegetation is small grasses and small shrubs. These are the type of plants that come back most quickly after fire. And so the question is, even though the cover here is about the same, if it's all low to the ground instead of in a canopy, it's about one to two meters high, um, does that provide the same ecosystem services to tortoises as an unburned community? So that's one of the things that would need to be evaluated. Um, so as I said, this study is still ongoing. We're still out collecting data, but we can draw a few conclusions based on what we have now. And that is, for one thing, there's still, even though the recovery time is faster, there's still the same short-term effects of fire on tortoises in the Sonoran is in the Mojave Desert. It still causes mortality due to burning or suffocation, and it does degrade their habitat in terms of shade sites and cover, things that are important. So our long-term monitoring so far has shown that recovery might be twice as fast in the Sonoran as in the Mojave Desert. But as with the Mojave, due to things like invasive grasses and urban development, fire is likely to continue to increase in frequency over the next several decades. So with this study, we will hopefully be able to assess recovery times for a lot of different vegetation communities throughout the state. When we know that, we can potentially assess, assess the threats to different Sonoran desert tortoise populations that are in different areas of the state based on their specific habitat. So in conclusion, I just want to acknowledge um, Tim Hughes, who is the Endangered Species Coordinator at BLM, who has provided funding for this study, and Rael Sanchez with the Forest Service, who we're working together with to sample on some Forest Service lands. And I'm going to pass it over to AJ now, who's going to talk about um, invasive species and what that means for tortoise diets. Thank you, Dan.
All right, so uh, so Dan, Felicia, and uh, and Marguerite all mentioned uh, how gra invasive grasses are affecting the desert landscape. Uh, uh, I guess first I'm going to acknowledge uh, Bureau of Land Management and Coyote Springs Investment for providing funding for this project, and our master grower, Nathan, who helped grow all the plants that we were able to uh, accomplish this study. Um, so like I said, um, the previous talks have already mentioned how uh, the invasive grasses are changing the desert landscape. But one of the issues as well is that invasive grasses, um, because they're not native to the landscape, may also have different and probably lower nutritional value compared to native plants. So we wanted to answer the question, do diets of invasive grasses negatively have a negative impact on desert tortoises? So what we did was we focused on our study on three uh, basically plant types for their diets. So we looked at brome, which is one of the invasive grasses. Uh, we looked at vulpia, which is a native grass, and then um, so just kind of talking about the difference between the two grasses. So you can kind of see the brome over here. It's got really big seed heads. Um, the vegetation is a lot coarser. Uh, this was actually taken quite a bit later in the season, so all the plants are um, on their uh, senescing and uh, on their way out. Um, but the vulpia grass, the seed heads are much more fine. Um, and you saw the previous picture where it's uh, much lusher uh, plant uh, forage. And then we also had uh, forbs. And so this was a mix of four different uh, native forb species. Uh, so we had uh, Camasonia, which I believe is one of the primroses. Uh, we had uh, Plantago, which is a plantain. And we had uh, desert poppy, or California poppy, and uh, desert dandelion. And then, so this was the uh, massive amount of forage that we had grown in the greenhouse, mostly with Nathan's help. Um, this was actually uh, quite a ways into our study. So the brome had mostly senesced and dried out uh, and had gone to seed. Uh, but all our forbs were still quite green uh, and tons of flowers from the poppies. So it was uh, pretty interesting. And so we actually did the study out at the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center. Um, we have a predator-proof enclosure here, um, and then we have several individual pens. And so each of these pens had about six to seven tortoises, and then uh, each of these pens got different diets. Um, so what we did with our three different uh, forage species, uh, we had one treatment that received all brome, one treatment that received only vulpia, uh, two treatments that were mixes of the native grasses and forbs, and then one that was all forbs. So basically what we're trying to get at is, you know, what happens, you know, as the, as the desert landscape becomes more and more dominated by brome, you know, obviously there's more brome out there and that's what the tourists are gonna have to eat. So what happens when the tourists can't find forbs when, you know, Brome is the only thing they have to eat. Um, so here first, um, you know, the tortoises, they ate the brome. Uh, and even in our uh, mixed treatment where they had access to the forbs, they still ate the, ate the brome quite readily. Um, they really seemed to like the seeds, um, which actually caused, causes some problems. Um, the, uh, basically, the, these large seeds um, will actually get impacted in the mouths of the tortoises and cause them problems. And especially for these little guys, I mean, they almost, you know, they can, you know, really jam up their, uh, their mouths. Um, so, and we did uh, monthly assessments. And then, so after every month, we removed any of the brome that had gotten stuck in the tortoises. Um, so here's a little guy enjoying some vulpia grass. And then here's a guy mowing down a uh, stalk of Camasonia, just going right at the base. Um, and so what we found uh, is that the growth actually was quite different. Um, so this is the, the cumulative growth, so uh, growth over time of the tortoises on the different treatments. So this 
These squares down here represent the Brome diet. Basically, everything else is up here. Um, so right here, we have our Vulpia grass. Um, and then here is our mixture of Brome and Forbes. And then here at the top, we have our Vulpia and Forbes and our Forbes treatments. Um, and so basically, uh, the Vulpia and Forbes and Forbes basically grew about somewhere in the neighborhood of you know five millimeters or so. Um, over these uh, five months of growth, or four months of growth that they had. And then, whereas the brome only grew about two millimeters. So a difference of, you know, two to three millimeters may not seem like all that much. Um, but with these juvenile tortoises, um, at least in the wild, their survival is really closely linked with how big they are, because the smaller you are as a tortoise, the more things can eat you. And the longer you're spent, the longer it takes you to grow, the longer you're at that smaller size, and the longer you're vulnerable to things. Um, whereas these guys that are growing faster, faster may be able to, you know, get large enough that they can escape predation. Um, so another thing that we measured, uh, we also looked at condition over time. Uh, so basically, um, this was a technique developed by the San Diego Zoo and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it bas it's basically a visual way of looking at uh, muscle tone on the tortoises. And so we see that um, over the time of the study, it, there was generally kind of a decline. And I think a lot of that was just due to, you know, going from spring when tortoises are pretty active and healthy. And then we get into these hotter months when it's uh, a little harder for the tortoises to actually get out and get food before it gets too hot. Um, and so, but here at the bottom, we kind of have our Brome and Vulpia. The Brome and Forbes was kind of halfway in between, and then the Vulpia and Forbes and Forbes were, were at the higher end. Um, and so basically, on average, like the two tortoises and the two grass treatments lost at least one uh, condition uh, point, whereas you know, the Forbes treatments generally had, were close to zero or um, well, on average only a half of a point. Um, so one thing um, that we've basically learned from all this is that um, basically a diet of all brome really does have some negative impacts on juvenile tortoises. Um, and one of the reasons that we chose juvenile tortoises was because we didn't want, well, we wanted to be able to um, have, a, have an effect that we can measure because adult tortoises are so robust for the most part that, um, and they take so long to grow that, you know, you can measure them for a year and you won't uh, detect a difference in their growth no matter what they're eating. Um, but so, you know, kind of the take home is that uh, brome is, can be really bad for these tortoises, whereas um, our native diets were much better but even having some Forbes is at least, at least somewhat mitigates the negative impacts of Rome. Um, so it's just going to be a question of, you know, trying to conserve native species as these landscapes, you know, become more and more dominated by Rome. And thanks. And now I will uh, turn it over to uh, Nathan, who's going to talk about OHVs. OHVs are um, off-highway vehicles. So I'm going to be talking about OHV use in kind of a transition zone between the Mojave and the Sonoran Desert in uh, Southern California, or <laughs> south of Nevada and California. <laughs> and um, also be talking about a simple way to measure the effectiveness of a OHV management plan that are the plants that are in place. So first, uh, I'd like to thank some of the SEA interns that helped me collect the data, and uh, USGS staff that were out there walking in washes with me. And uh, I'd like to thank some of the BLM employees and uh, thank the California BLM State Office for funding this project. So a little bit of background on OHV activity. It's been steadily increasing in the United States 
since about the 1960s. And out here in the West, it's pretty popular because there's so much public land available for recreation. And as you increase OHB activity, you're also increasing this large footprint of OHB roads that are available. And it's just a huge network that spider work, spider webs across, across the desert. And desert washes in, in these areas become corridors that can connect a road to a road, or they become a road themselves. Um, and they are also pathways to desirable locations. And having more OHBs in wash areas um, leads to the potential for habitat modification or degradation in sensitive areas um, for tortoises. So a desert wash is just a uh, channel for um, the flow of water um, from large rain events, you get a large amount of water really washing through these places. And with more water, there, above, there are pools of water above ground and below ground. So these washes store more water for longer periods of time. Um, so you get more plant production in these areas. And because there's more water, you also get larger vegetation um, that provide protection from the sun and predators to tortoises. Um, the washes also provide shelters for um, burrowing animals and increase food and water opportunities. Our study area was in a plot of land, about 880,000 acres um, south of Needles, California. Um, it was in a desert wildlife management area that was created by the Northern and Eastern Colorado Desert Plan to protect desert tortoise habitat. And within this plot of land, they created zones that were made to regulate OHB use in washes. So they made 70, they made zones that were 75% closed and 25% open uh, to OHB use in washes. So here's a map of the study area. Um, you can see it's just, I think needles is somewhere in there. Um, and this area, you can see the orange is the closed wash zones, and the green is the open are the open wash zones. Um, you can see there's quite a bit more area in the closed than the open. And the the road layer that's on there is a uh, the best road layer they have up. I mean, there are way, way more roads out there than what this shows, but as you can see, there are quite a few roads that go through there. Um, over top of our study area, I laid this desert tortoise habitat model that Nusir et al. created. And it has a habitat index that ranges from zero to one, zero being the unsuitable habitat for desert tortoises and one being a highly suitable habitat for desert tortoises. So as you can see, in all, pretty much all the areas, open or closed, it's all pretty good habitat for a desert tortoise. Um, the objectives of this project were to determine the frequency of OHB use in open and closed wash zones. And we were doing that by um, focusing on high activity weekends, like three day weekends, that more people would be likely to be out in the desert on their OHBs. Uh, we also wanted to develop a protocol for future OHB monitoring in uh, other areas or in the same area. if possible by other agencies. And uh, we wanted to evaluate um, degradation or um, condition of desert wash suitable desert tortoise habitat. So we kind of termed two types of washes. We have holiday washes that were all intersected by roads. Um, and we these are the ones that we visited multiple times. And we did a 100 meter transect on both sides of the road, which the wash flowed through. Um, we also had dispersed washes, which were just, they were not associated with roads and they were at least on average one kilometer away from a road. And we just laid a 200 meter transect in a random point in the wash. 
And down here are just some, some of the data that we collected. Um, the tracks were used to determine the frequency of use and some of the other um, data were used for the degradation and uh, condition of habitat. So for our uh, field season, we had uh, 49 washes in open wash zones and 45 washes in closed wash zones uh, for the holiday monitoring. And later on, you'll see pre and post holiday on some of the graphs. Um, the pre-holiday were the data that we collected on the first visit to the, to the washes that were intersected by roads. And um, post-holiday were the um, a combination of all the visits after we visited the washes after holidays. Um, in all these washes, we raked a line across at about 100 meters down the wash that ran perpendicular to the flow of the wash so that anybody who drove through the wash would be able to tell from our, from our last visit that they had been through there. Um, here's a list of the holidays that we went out. Um, the dispersed washes, we had 56 in open and 55 in closed wash zones. And these were just visited one time and they were not raked. Um, here's some pictures of the line that we drew. And you can see it's pretty easy to tell when somebody drives over your line. And it's a cheap and easy way to, to know what's going on out there. So this graph shows the frequency of use in open and closed wash zones. Um, here's this pre-holiday I was talking about. So the first visit to our holiday washes showed a lower frequency of tracks enclosed than open wash zones. So that's good. That means people are staying or driving more in open wash zones than closed. The post-holiday had the same kind of trend. Um, this is just a combination of all holidays. So again, there's a lower frequency of tracks enclosed than open wash zones. Uh, the dispersed washes in the middle here there was no difference between use between open and closed wash zones, um, but there was also very little use in these, in these washes that were further away from roads. Um, here are the holidays broken down uh, with the number of tracks per holiday. Uh, for New Year's, there wasn't a significant difference between open and closed wash zones. Um, and then President's Day and Easter, they had about the same amount of use um, for each holiday weekend, and there was a lower frequency of OHVs in closed wash zones and open wash zones. Um, so again, they are showing that they they are kind of following the rules and staying more in the open wash zone areas. Um, the wash condition. Um, so we we took things that we think are um, the data that were bad for desert tortoise habitats, like trash and uh, bank cuts by OHVs and uh, raven presence. And we kind of created a score for, for open and closed wash zones. And this shows for pre-holiday and dispersed washes, there wasn't a significant difference between open and closed wash zones. Uh, for post-holiday washes, it was had a significantly lower degradation score in closed and open wash zones, um, which kind of follows the trend of more people in open wash zones than closed wash zones. Um, for the holidays, New Year's, there was no difference between scores. There was also less activity for New Year's. That's true. It was colder then, and as it warmed up, there was more activity. <laughs> uh, for the other holidays, there was uh, significantly lower scores in the closed wash zones and open wash zones. Again, there were more people in the open wash zones than the closed wash zones. Uh, desert tortoise activity, so um, presence of burrows, scat, tracks, um, or live tortoises, was marginally greater in closed wash zones than open wash zones. So in conclusion, it seems like the OHV activity is typically concentrated near roads, um, yet even that activity was lower in 
closed wash zones than open wash zones. So it suggests that people are generally adhering to BLM's OHB policy in uh, the Shimwebi Desert Wildlife Management Area. Um, but another part of that we're looking at is that it could just be due because this, this area is very lightly used by OHB activity by OHBs compared to other areas that are closer to uh, more populated areas. Um, so it, it could be a combination of that and distance to paved road um, could be a huge contribution to this because a lot of people don't want to travel far off of a paved road just to do whatever the activity they want to do out there. So uh, another part of this we're looking at is should soon be coming. And I, I mentioned the dispersed washes just had a low um, incidence of use overall. Um, so further away from roads, there's just not as much activity going on out there. And I'll leave you with a uh, quote from Robert Stebbins about OHB and washes. And if you guys have any questions now for anybody who presented, now would be the time. Um, there was slightly more activity by tortoises in the closed wash zones and the open wash wash zones. Um, this is such these areas are so big. It's, there's really not a lot of um, presence of BLM out there. I mean, we were out there for five to six months, and I never saw anybody that was employed by BLM out there. Um, they originally had talked about using signs, but signs are expensive and signs get damaged. Um, really, I think the best option is to provide um, provide better maps, provide apps, even if, you know, if, if it's an area that you can use a phone app, to, because it's hard to tell where you're at. When you, they just put a zone, it's not easy to see where you're at when you're on the ground. Um, so I think just educating the public is probably the best method. We want to have this right. Yeah. Thanks a lot for everybody's patience and for some long talks. And we'll be around for a little bit to answer more questions if anybody wants to. Thank too early she couldn't remember fabulous thanks so much everybody thank you for coming today and we'll see you in september